Hi everyone, hope you enjoyed Sarah last night speaking about the events of Good Friday and the Lord's death and what it meant. Today we've got a very special guest, Paul Weaver. Paul was the former General Secretary and leader of Assemblies of God. He's been a dear friend to myself over the years. Um, he's got a great insight into the whole of the Easter story. As I mentioned yesterday in the introduction, Paul worked in Jerusalem for many years and so has deep insight into some of the customs and the traditions and the historical facts regarding the Easter story. So sit back again and listen to Paul and enjoy his gifting and his ministry. I know you're going to be blessed by him and I know that God's going to speak into your life. Hope we can see you tomorrow morning at church. If not, have a happy Easter day. Look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you. Bye bye. Hello, my name is Paul Weaver and it's my privilege to share with you some thoughts on the weekend that changed the world. These thoughts are really shaped from my study of scripture but also from my work and journeyings through Israel and particularly in Jerusalem over many, many years. One of the biggest problems, of course, is when we are looking at something that happened in the East uh, and we project into that Eastern story our Western culture. And this sometimes confuses the issue. Our paintings of Jesus, for example, and Hollywood's uh, uh, presentation of Christ is often a white person with long blonde hair with blue eyes uh, acting as the Christ and of course that would not be the case in fact it would be very very difficult to find a Caucasian character in the Bible at all so we have no idea of really what went on in many cases from a Western perspective uh, in addition to that is the topology of the land and of course, because many people haven't been there, they don't quite know what has to be overcome into making a journey. Uh, let's take, for instance, the journey from Jerusalem to Galilee. And that would be about um, uh, 80 miles. It would take a two, and a half, two and a half hours in an air conditioned car today to make that journey. Of course, 2000 years ago, it would take probably four days at least on foot. Uh, and uh, they would have to overcome desert conditions, uh, uh, high temperatures, mountains, uh, uh, wild animals and all sorts of uh, uh, threats and difficulties along the way, uh, which would make the journey quite dangerous. And uh, just think that Jesus made that journey from Jerusalem to Galilee many, many times in his life. Uh, and so just trying to understand where uh, the, those uh, disciples and Christ all those years ago had to uh, make um, their journey through difficult situations that are quite different to what we see today. So in this short time that I want to share with you, I want to challenge you again to think about the Easter story. Uh, and as we dig a little deeper into the happenings of this momentous day, uh, I want us to look and pause to allow the sufferings and the journey and the resurrection of Christ to stimulate our faith and our Christian journey. There are five scenes that I want to bring to you today for your thoughts. Uh, the man, first of all, scene one, the man, Christ Jesus, before his crucifixion. At the time of Christ's crucifixion, Jesus had already lived a sinless life. He, it was pure, holy, and it was very physically fit. He had spent the last three and a half years of his life walking the roads of the Holy Land, engaging with the many needs of people. And he had a massive following. People came out, they even went into the desert to listen to him. And so this great following that Jesus had was inspirational. And yet he comes now to these uh, days just before the crucifixion, and he begins to be rejected. And so he's rejected by the people. Uh, the people who had sung Hosanna are now saying, crucify him. Uh, he's betrayed by Judas, who goes out and secretly does a deal and sells Jesus for the cost of a slave. And then he's denied by Peter, who, if you look in the original language, uh, uh, uses foul language and uh, multiplication of lies 
to justify that he has nothing to do with Jesus. And then, of course, the dispersal of all the disciples, with the exception of John. And it seems that cancel culture <laughs> is not a new thing. And then Jesus has to face uh, the, the, the journey of his spirituality and mental faculties being tested. The battle in the Garden of Gethsemane is a good illustration. His three closest disciples go to sleep. He's left on his own. And the Bible describes it in Luke as a battlefield, a spiritual battlefield. And Jesus is wrestling now with his humanity. Uh, and he's saying, if it's possible uh, for me to uh, be excused this part of the journey, uh, but then he comes back with the preference for his father's will above his own desires and uses those familiar words, not my will, but yours be done. And this is so intense that the Bible actually describes this process of prayer and battle uh, as a, a moment when beads of blood are being forced through the pores of the brow of Jesus Christ. Uh, because of the difficulty and the tension within him. And uh, you that are medical people will know that this can happen in extreme mental anxiety situations. And then, of course, he has to go through the imprisonment test. And this was very interesting because he was taken to the chief priest's house. And in, the, in that particular building, there was a prison. Now, the prison wasn't the same as the ones that we see on television with doors and access of that nature. But this particular prison was a hole in the ground in the house. And so the person who was the prisoner would be let down by a rope into a very cold, damp and totally dark cave in the ground. And uh, that's what happened to Jesus. So he's, he's dropped out of sight into this uh, prison in the ground, this hole in the ground. And it's interesting how imagery can be heightened uh, in understanding by location. So Jesus has declared himself before this as the light of the world. And yet now he's submerged into total darkness. He's the way, the truth and the life. And yet now he's trapped in a space without a door. And so this, this picture, this experience must have been quite something for Jesus to endure. And then, of course, comes the physical torture and testing his willingness to become the Lamb of God who dies for the sin of the world. And the Sanhedrin actively begin this process. Uh, they take part in the physical persecution of Jesus Christ. They are spitting in the face of Jesus. They're punching and slapping him in the face. The soldiers add to his uh, torture by ripping his beard from his face, dressing him as a king, uh, placing a crown of thorns on his head, blindfolding him and then taunting him as they repeatedly beat him over the head and slap his head, spitting in his face. And finally, they take the whip out and they apply 39 stripes to his back, removing the skin, uh, impacting upon the muscle uh, structure, and finally revealing the ribcage, leaving him bruised, beaten, and unrecognizable. And then he has to pull himself together somehow, mentally, uh, to be able to face three different courts who are going to pass a judgment upon him. He's weakened physically, mentally, emotionally, and yet now he has to gather his thoughts together, gather his strength together uh, so that he can withstand the verbal accusations, lies and threats and make an argument for his case before the ecclesiastical trial, the Roman trial and the local council trial. For Jesus to still be alive after all this is quite amazing and reveals the level of his physical emotional uh, and emotional fitness and also his love and determination to save us. May I suggest you just pause for a moment this recording and uh, just reflect on that and bring thanksgiving 
to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. We now come to the second scene of Christ's journey. The man, Christ Jesus, and the journey to the place of crucifixion. This journey is much debated in Jerusalem today. The Orthodox Church, since the 18th century, have followed the path along the Via Della Rosa road street journey known as the Sorrowful Way. This journey would take you from Pilate's Praetorium in East Jerusalem to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There's another route that would take you to the Garden Tomb in East Jerusalem outside the city walls. And that probably offers perhaps the most compact visual possibility for us to understand being next to a known place of execution with a garden nearby and a family tomb that fits the biblical description. Whichever route Jesus took historically, and no one can be sure of that, it would take about 20 minutes for a healthy person to walk from the place of flagellation to the place of crucifixion. For Jesus, however, this would have taken much longer because he's carrying this horizontal part of the cross. Remember that people who were crucified never carried a cross like this. They only carried the horizontal part and it was called the patibulum and they carried that on their back. It weighed between 75 and 125 pounds or between five and eight stone. Just imagine having that weight placed on a lacerated back and having to carry it through crowded streets of mockers and mourners. And the three people who were being crucified would have taken that particular journey together as they made their way to the place of crucifixion. We know that Jesus required help from a man called Simon uh, Serene to carry this horizontal weight on his back. We don't know biblically any more about Simon, but what we do know is that history tells us that he went to Egypt to preach the gospel after this, and in AD 100 was cut in half by with a sword or and uh, martyred for Jesus. So. Let's just think about that journey, Jesus going through the streets with the weight upon his back and the people around him bringing various messages uh, as, they, uh, as he made his journey to the place of crucifixion. So well, let us pause and let's be grateful and strengthened by the endurance of Christ on his journey. And as we contemplate our personal journey. You may be facing something today that you don't want to face. You don't want to go to that place to uh, face up to it. Then remember, Jesus had to do that. He had to go to the place of crucifixion, face up to what was going to happen and submit himself to it. And I find that wonderfully challenging. We come now to the third scene of the story, the place of crucifixion. Here is the man Christ Jesus at the place of crucifixion. Now, the place of, of crucifixion is another area where it, Western influence has unfortunately told a different story. Most of us were raised to believe that Jesus died on a green hill. And the reason why we were raised to believe that was because uh, this was brought into a line of music uh, and uh, poetry by Cecil Francis Alexander in 1868. And she wrote a children's hymn called There is a Green Hill Far Away. This hymn is quite beautiful and in most parts it is very expressive and descriptive of what really took place. But concerning where it took place, it was... Uh, uh, projecting an idea and a visual image that is not true to scripture or to history. And so we know that crucifixions did not take place on hills, but down at the roadside, generally at a point where the volume of travellers 
was greatest. So a crossroads, for instance, would be a good place to have crucifixion. Both Matthew and Mark allude to this in their Gospels when they talk about all those who pass by. They're talking about those who are traveling, passing by the crucifixion scene. The Romans used crucifixion not only as a punishment, but also as a deterrent, a way of curbing criminal behavior. And so they would be saying, in effect, look, this is what happens if you break the law. The roadside was also the place of accessibility for the crowd to vent their feelings verbally and physically by spitting on the victim and clenching their fists to show their disgust. The Bible describes the place of crucifixion as Golgotha or Calvary, both meaning the place of a skull. We see in these names that Jesus was taken to a recognized place of crucifixion outside the walls of Jerusalem. These places of crucifixion were always outside the walls because of their uh, spectacle and the stench and the desire to keep the city of Jerusalem free from impurity. So let's just stop for a moment now and think about the place of crucifixion. Jesus could well have seen other people crucified in this place. He knew where he was heading. He knew the sounds that haunted this type of location. He knew the anger and the cruelty that was enacted at the places of crucifixion. But he is willing to go to it. And he's willing, by the grace of God, to conquer it. The fourth scene that I want to share with you today is the man Christ Jesus and the crucifixion process. Both men and women were crucified by the Romans. The process of crucifixion was clearly defined. First, you offer a drink to the person who is about to be crucified. And they, the idea of that is to numb the pain. Jesus was offered drinks of various types throughout his endurance of the cross. The next step is humiliation. And the victim is stripped completely naked before the crowd. Imagine the embarrassment of the sinless Christ having to experience this exposure of his physical form. He was totally naked on the cross. Thirdly, the victim is called, is nailed to the patibulum. And fourthly, you hoist the victim on the cross member of the cross to be hung on the vertical post called a starus. The starus is a permanent fixture at the place of crucifixion and is a way of identifying to the stranger in an area the place of crucifixion. Once the body has been raised and fixed to the vertical post, the victim's feet is nailed to the vertical post about 18 inches from the ground. And this is to enable conversation to take place and abuse from the crowd. Jesus now looks down from the cross on soldiers gambling away his clothes. The only material item Jesus owned was now subject to the throw of a dice. Jesus leaves no material legacy. There is no prosperity teaching here. Finally, the description of the victim's crime is attached to the top of the cross. The victim then is left to hang there, exposed to elements until death by exhaustion or asphyxiation. The process of death can take days in some cases. 
The crucif crucified person sustains their duration of life on the cross by straightening their legs and pulling with their arms to lift their chest to gain breath in their lungs. The victim will then hold themselves in that position as long as they can before their knees get tired and their legs bend and their body sinks back to a drooping position. The crowd watch this struggle of the up and down and sometimes uh, uh, that movement, the sound of the groans, the cries of the victims uh, is felt at this moment. Everyone can feel that pain. Jesus is having to handle this with additional discomfort because in this continual up and down movement, it is move, his body is moving and his back is rubbing against the vertical post on a rib cage, the whipping of the 39 stripes. Let's pause again and consider this relentless journey of pain that represents the incredible love of our Saviour for each one of us. It brings us into focus again uh, with the commitment of God to save us uh, from our sins and also with those familiar words that we quote so easily and forget the pain and the price for God so loved the world that he gave us his son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want to suggest to you that to endure such sufferings without complaint would be truly amazing but Jesus now, in the midst of this pain and this struggle for, for breath and life, he now enters into dialogue with several people from the cross. First with the crowd. This is his first point of address. And what he does, he prays for the people who are screaming in opposition to him. Forgive them, Father. They do not know what they are doing. This is what the cross is all about. Forgiveness. Christ's prayer for people to be forgiven at the same time as he is dying to make that very thing happen. The crowd's response, hyped by the religious leaders, is to insult, ver ver verbally hurt, and to seek to discredit Christ. <laughs> if you are Christ, come down from the cross. If you are the son of God, then they quote the words of Jesus about him being the temple, being destroyed and built again in three days. The amazing thing is this, and Luke picks it up. He says, as time passes, when all the people who had gathered together to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. Then we see Jesus addressing uh, the chief priests or the chief priests addressing him. The chief priests, teachers and laws of the, and elders uh, want to uh, turn uh, their, their venom on Christ through the words that he has spoken. And they, they, they're talking about Jesus uh, being the son of God. Uh, and yet here he is being crucified and they're mocking him. And they say, they, they say to him, he, he said he could save others, but he can't even save himself. If he's the king of the Jews, let him come down from the cross and we will believe. So what they're doing now, they're quoting back the words of Jesus. And Jesus is having to handle these words coming directly at him in all the pain and suffering that he is having to endure. And then we hear the dialogue of the other two men who are on the cross. Uh, the dialogue begins in unison and it is a, a, a mocking of Jesus, but ends up in a divided conclusion. One rejects Jesus, concerned only about his freedom from the cross. Save yourself and us, he says. The others embrace the person of Christ and he declares his position and his kingly position 
to be something that he wants to follow. And so here you have on the cross the amazing picture of free will in action in the most graphic way. One rejects, the other accepts. Jesus is reeling in agony. All around him are the voices of opposition. When through the, the cacophony of verbal rejection, Jesus hears these words from the criminal next to him. First, a word of rebuke for the other criminal on the cross, and then a plea from the Christ. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Wow! Revelation in the midst of opposition and pain. He accepts the Savior, recognition of the King, but the King of another world, not of this world, but of the world to come. Here is hope. Here is the possibility of salvation. Remember me when you come into your kingdom and Jesus responds today. You will be with me in paradise. The promise of eternal life. It is an amazing conversation that goes on on that cross. And now Jesus turns to Mary for another conversation. Jesus is the oldest male in the family. Joseph, his father, died at some point between Jesus being 12 and the crucifixion of Jesus. Jewish law requires the eldest son to take care of the remaining members of the family. Mary, Christ's mother, is watching her son slowly die before her. The sword of emotional pain is cutting into her heart. Jesus looks down and he addresses his responsibility for Mary, his mother, by directing her attention to John and saying, Dear woman, here is your son. John is the faithful one. He hasn't deserted. He doesn't deny Christ. He is at the cross. It's interesting that John was the only apostle not to be martyred. Jesus now turns to this faithful disciple, John, and says, here is your mother. John tells us this in his gospel. From that time, I took Mary to my home. It's interesting to observe that Mary was probably only in her 40s when this all happened around the cross. And now we come to the interface between the Father and the Son. It is the most difficult part of the crucifixion for Jesus and the most problematic theologically to fully explain and understand. The interface between Jesus and the Father includes a prayer, a desperate cry and an act of faith. The prayer, Father, forgive them. The prayer is Christ's first verbal priority on the cross and reinforces why he is there. The test of true love is found at the point of our ability to forgive those who have injured us. And then the desperate cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This cry shows us the depth and the mystery of what redemptive um, uh, substitutional death is. There are questions that immediately spring to mind. Can God be separated from himself? Was the Father separated from the incarnate Christ on the cross? The argument of the critics centered on this very point. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. What does this word forsake mean? The word means literally to leave a person where they are without help. We have five references in the New Testament that uses this exact word. Two verses are to do with God never leaving us. Thank God for that. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. Two verses are to do with people leaving another person. In the case of the two stories, it's people leaving Paul, Demas has forsaken me, and then all have forsaken me. And then one verse to do with the assembling of ourselves together. Forsake not, don't leave each other without any help. Come together. It is clear from Christ's cry that he felt that his father had left him alone to suffer 
and pay the price for our salvation. That's what he felt. My God, why have you forsaken me? And I want to say to you today, that is exactly what happened. The father gave his son, but the son alone could pay the price. The hymn writer says there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven to let us in. We can't look at the cross in isolation. The crucifixion of Jesus is the significant turning point for mankind that was represented in every Old Testament type, promise and provision. Jesus understood this and he articulates it when he says in the Gospel of John, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The father and the son knew what was coming. And this critical point now in the crucifixion of Christ as the substitutional lamb nailed to the altar, the cross on the eve of Passover, suffering and dying to pay the redemptive price for our salvation. This incredible act of selfless courage and sacrifice can only be made by one person, the man Christ Jesus. Christ is really alone. He is without help. But this does not mean the Father is absent. The Bible tells us from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. The Jewish time for this is 12 o'clock midday to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. This is the hottest part of the day. It is at this point that the father surrounds his son in darkness, shielding him from the burning sun on his naked body. At the ninth hour, Jesus cries, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did he make this cry while still in the dark or at the moment of light returning? We don't know. Can God be absent from time? The answer is most definitely no. He is omnipresent everywhere at the same time. But at that moment, the father was there, but through choice, unable to help his son. The father is waiting to spring back into action. The final minutes of this incredible sacrifice of Christ are being enacted. Jesus takes a drink. And then shouts in a loud voice, it is finished. And now we come to the last act of Jesus, the act of final commitment. Jesus calls out in a loud voice, Father, into your hand. I command, I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last breath. This act of commitment by Jesus Christ shows that Jesus never lost faith in his father, even though he felt he was forsaken. Notice the precise moment his son breathes this last breath and hands his spirit to the father. Then and then only can the father respond to the perfect sacrifice of the son. And he does. And he does it dramatically. At that moment, says the scripture, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The old was gone. The new had come. Limitation had been lifted and God's presence was available for the whosoever. The earth shook and the rocks spilt. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life, says the scripture. They came out of their tombs and after the resurrection of Jesus, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Salvation has come. Resurrection to new life was here. Victory over sin and death was possible. Hallelujah. The Bible records when the centurion and those who were guarding him saw the earthquake 
and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. The last area of meditation I want to bring to you is the scene where the man Christ Jesus is buried and resurrected. At the cross are two important men, Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple called Nicodemus. Both are members of the Sanhedrin. Both are wealthy and are going to take very carefully this body of Jesus that has been beaten and bruised and broken and they're going to take it down from the cross with incredible care and love and they're going to bury it. For Nicodemus this is a big day because he's going to come out to declare his allegiance to Jesus Christ before the rest of the religious leaders. History tells us this cost him everything. It cost him his position and finally his business and his wealth. Joseph of Arimathea owns the garden next to Golgotha with an unused family tomb in it. They both are granted permission to remove the body from the cross after the soldiers had broken the legs of Jesus. They carry the body to the tomb. They prepare the body with the various spices required, a job that is usually done by the women. But because the Sabbath was speedily approaching and they needed to bury the body before Passover, they prepared the body for burial themselves. On completion, the stone was rolled back in front of the open uh, tomb and the job was done. The weekend was nearly over. On the Passover day, the chief priests and Pharisees panic and they wanted to secure this tomb with a seal so that the body could not be stolen. They went to Pilate, secured the seal and a guard was commissioned to stand outside of the tomb. Now we come to the Sabbath. After the Sabbath, everything changes. The first day of the week saw the women going to the tomb. They were about to become the first witnesses of the resurrection, even though they didn't know it. An earthquake happened. An angel appears and rolls the stone away from the tomb and sits on it in glorious shining light that made the guards so afraid they shook and fell to the ground like dead men. The angel consoles the women by inviting them into the empty tomb, declaring the resurrection message. He's not here, he is risen, and gives them their commission to tell the disciples of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The next few hours and days for the disciples were times of assimilation of what had really happened, revelation of what was now required of them, and encouragement for a new day. What a saviour. As we have meditated today on this amazing weekend that changed the world, I pray that your appreciation of your loving saviour, his work and sacrifice, will deepen you, and deepen your love for him and quicken your desire to share the gospel with those who are still in darkness. Just as everything that Jesus prophesied would happen concerning his life and death and resurrection, all of these came to pass as promised. There's coming a day when Jesus is coming back again. And I want to say to you today that you can trust him. Uh, you can believe what he said, because what he said before has come to pass. And when he says, I will come again, it will come to pass and he will come and take us home to our eternal home where we will live with him forevermore. And I want to just say, and what a day that will be. So God bless you today. And I hope that some of the thoughts I brought to you may help you uh, in your journey of understanding. In Jesus name. Amen.